not as much earlier this year as now, but we're beginning to see it. But also, and this was the, I thought, the genius of Bill Clinton's convention speech. Bill Clinton shifted that question from are you better off to are we better off? And that's a better question for Democrats to ask. In part, just, just because of their own basic philosophy that we is more important than just you. <laughs> collectively, well, collectively we probably are, and Bill did such a nice job of that. He really got people to focus on that. And then, of course, the magic wand of arithmetic just caught those folks by surprise. But though Clinton didn't do it quite as directly, there was also the side of are you better off, are we better off, that transcends the economy. And when you think about some of those things, if you're a woman who was discriminated against at your work, at your workplace, over and over again, and you didn't know how ugly it was, you're better off than you were four years ago. Because the Lilly Ledbetter law is going to protect you. You're going to get to sue. If you're a gay soldier, how much better off are you are than, you, than you were four years ago? If you're a married gay couple, the Defense of Marriage Act is not really being enforced by the Obama administration. I mean, there's so many sets of people. And as I th think about that, um, I feel better about that too. I mean, I'm not a soldier and not gay and you know, all the rest of that, but I feel better because my society's fairer. And I believe in that. I, I'm not black either, but I really was happy when the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed. That made me feel good. And the Voting Rights Act the following year, that made me feel like America was a better place to be in. And I think there, that, you know, is that a majority sentiment? I don't know. But it's a sentiment that an awful lot of people feel, and that's not captured in are you better off? Are we better off is the question. And Bill Clinton made that switch. And that really worked out pretty well for Mr. Obama. Now, the next thing I want to think a little bit about here, uh, or talk a little bit about here, the backward election didn't work. But for Mitt Romney, forward was going to come in anyway. Nobody was going to let him run that. See that guy? He messed up. Put me in. I'm going to go talk to my next group. They weren't going to let him do that. In the end, you can't. And so he had to start saying something. Well, he really spun his wheels, for the most part, in saying those forward-looking things. And he'd have to change back. And then, OK, well, I'll go with Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan's forward looking. He wrote that 10-year budget for the House of Representatives. He's young. He's considered an intellectual. I commend to you Paul Krugman columns for the past year about how intellectual Mr. Ryan really is. But he's, you know, the reputation is there still that this is a, a, a policy heavyweight when Bill Clinton pretty well took him apart with arithmetic. I mean, do mathematicians get upset when somebody says, why don't you do the math, when they, what they really mean is add things up? I think they should if they don't. Math is hard. Arithmetic's OK. You got a calculator. Come on. Math is hard stuff. I think mathematicians should be bothered by that. But and, you know, I, sorry, being silly. I always do that. Um, but when he tried to go forward, even with Ryan, None of it really quite worked out. There was never a vision of where forward was. And that's where Romney began to slip. But as we all know, paraphrasing a bumper sticker, debates happen. <clears throat> and it happened. And I don't know if the debate made as much difference as you know, the post-game analysis, but <laughs> The president lost some ground. He didn't lose very many folks that were going to vote for him. What, what, what we think we know, as best we can tell, uh, what happened, people that were pretty much mushy Romney supporters, okay, they, they knew that in the end that's what they were going to have to do, but they weren't thrilled about it, finally had what they could point to as an excuse. Well, I can vote for him. I mean, he did really well in that debate. He did really well in that debate. Everybody said he did really well in that debate. And I, and I watched it, and I thought he was doing pretty good. 
What I, what I was reminded of, and I, I don't want to, yeah, okay, we're, we're going to wrap this up in about five minutes or so here, but, but um, when I thought about that debate, I kept thinking about, because baseball is my, the only other thing I know anything about, uh, I kept thinking that what you've got is Obama in the batter's box. And then this guy comes out, this pitcher comes out, and he's full of confidence. He knows he's got his stuff. He's just, he's got it. And he throws two or three batting practice fastballs, and the, and the president just watches him go by. And then he says, hmm, and decides to bounce a slider in the dirt, the opposite batter's box. There's no umpire. It's not ball one. You can't walk the guy. Oh, really? I'm going to try some more of those. I'm going to throw sliders against the wall. And he did. And the president didn't swing at those, thinking, you don't swing at something that bad. <laughs> but he, but he should, with no umpire, no manager to come and jerk the guy out, you probably ought to take a swing at some of those. Uh, but he didn't. And, and he fouled off a couple of the batting practice fastballs, like Simpson Bowles. You know, he said, well, I am working on it. When really the, the, the answer at that point for him was simple. It would have been in Congress a lot earlier if Paul Ryan hadn't killed it. You remember Mr. Ryan? I mean, that's all. Yeah. Every judge, please. Oh, that's true. We knew that. We knew that. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry. I, I just was sure that he was going to close it with, Luke, I am your father. <laughs> and uh, no, you can't be. No, that can't happen. Anyway, that's pretty good for somebody who's never seen a Star Wars movie, don't you think? I think that's really pretty good. I've heard all about all of them. Anyway, uh, to, to, to kind of wrap wrap that up. That may be a silly analogy, but that's the way I felt, that, that, that the president was letting easy pitches go by, and then when the guy started throwing stuff, I mean, think about some of the things he said. It basically is a curveball bounced in the dirt across in the opposite batter's box. It's so far from reality that you flinch a minute and think, well, how do I deal with that? You know, how do I hit that kind of a pitch? And then the guy throws a bunch more of them. And the worst part about it for the president is, the next morning, all the sports writers and all the fans said, that pitcher, that guy was confident. He knew what he was doing. He, 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 yeah. And only, the only one I saw was the night of the debate. It was Al Sharpton, of all people. Al Sharpton said, yeah. But he lied. Every single one of those was a lie. And everybody else said, yes, but the president looked awful. Yes, but, but, but. And they just drowned Al out. I mean, Chris Matthews, I think, probably popped a blood vessel. I think he may have had to be operated on the next morning to be ready for his show. I mean, he was so, he was just really upset. Well, is it going to be a big deal or not? I don't know. You know, it, it might be. Right now, the polls are closer than they were. Uh, the Democrats are telling us that they would have gotten closer anyway, and the Republicans are saying it's the beginning of the steamroller, you will never survive, and who knows which one is true. Um, what we do know for sure is when Ronald Reagan debated Walter Mondale for the first time, Reagan looked like an old man in over his head. And he won 49 states. Later, Minnesota held out for Fritz. And that was it. But Reagan looked so bad. I went into a class the next morning, and I said, so how do you think it went? And I had this young man uh, in there who, I don't think he's doing it anymore, but he was a news anchor in Green Bay for quite a number of years. Tim Blotz was his name. And, and, and Tim just said, that guy needs to have his clutch replaced. There's just absolutely no way he can go from one gear to another. And he did. He looked really, it didn't matter. He really didn't make very much difference in the end. And, you know, George W. got whooped up on pretty good by John Kerry once, and then that didn't amount to much. Uh, it's just, we don't know if they really do end up mattering. Who knows? Maybe Biden will 
rescue, you know, Super Joe will come in and rescue, or maybe the president will be on his game next time, or maybe all this better economic news will sink in. You know, today there was a lot of stuff about uh, the lowest foreclosure rate in five years, the lowest number of new unemployment claims in four years. Yeah, who knows, maybe. But the point is, we don't know if that really changed it, but we know that the conventional wisdom in the punditry is that it changed it. And there's a handful of people that are holding out against that conventional wisdom. Okay, who knows. Now, one last thing. I said I'd try to talk a minute or two what happens uh, afterward. Let's go to what isn't going to happen, sadly, um, in some senses. Doesn't matter who wins, there is no mandate for this president. Whoever wins will be sitting there without a mandate. Now, we don't give mandates very often. Uh, it's a separation of powers, checks and balances based system and mandates come when you sweep both houses and you win the presidency and everybody's waiting breathlessly for you to do something. That's when you get them, otherwise you just don't get them. And in this election, neither one's gonna get one. It's also true that it's hard to imagine this particular two-party system going back to the two-party system of 30 or 40 years ago and cooperating with each other and working with each other and saying, look, there's stuff we gotta get done. Like, you see that over there? That's called the fiscal cliff. It's got that name for a reason. If we go over, this car may very well not be repairable. Oh, but as, as McConnell said and Maynard said, some hostages you shoot, some hostages you trade. Well, they may be ready to shoot it. I don't know, who's to say? I mean, so the, the, between the party system and the, the governing system we have, and those are a mismatch now, you know, your parliamentary <coughs> parties in a congressional system, we're not gonna get any really significant movement in any direction, I don't care which one of them wins. But we will get a different person making the nominations for the courts and so on. But the, system, the well is almost sufficiently poisoned that that may not matter much either. Who could Barack Obama nominate that the Republicans won't filibuster. I don't know. Richard, you want to be a judge? Maybe not. Okay, <laughs> but you should be. So it, it, it's, it's, I don't think we're going anywhere very exciting over the next four years. Uh, certainly, I have a preference as to which, which one, but I'm not sure it will make the kind of difference that I really would like to have it be able to make. I just, I just don't see that on the horizon. Okay, I think that's pretty close to 50 minutes, and uh, if there are any questions, I'd love to hear what they are. Or comments, you know, you don't have to ask a question. Uh, yeah, more so. It's again, traditionally accepted in self-election, I congratulate you. <laughs> okay, but I'd like to know a little bit more about the 501s and 4s and super tax funding, what kind of things that has, and whether the parties can still constrain that in some way, or whether now it's starting to Oh, I think there's not much question that those groups, you know, they've got more money than anybody else, and they spend it. Uh, and by definition, those groups can't spend it for a candidate. They must spend it against a candidate. Now, it doesn't say against a candidate. It's, it's an issue advocacy, blah, blah, blah. But they can apparently throw any amount of negative money they want to into a race. And because they have it, you know, in, in Brinks trucks full, they just go ahead and do it. And the early part of the race, uh, Romney's super PAC put a tremendous amount of money in, and they really got nowhere. It was apparently a situation where they really just couldn't get done what they thought they wanted to get done. But the Karl Rove money, the Koch brothers money, that funnels through a different set of organizations, we still don't know how important those are going to turn out to be, whether they're gonna have as much impact as we think. It could be pretty ugly. And it's not gonna change because the, the, the Roberts Court is simply not gonna say we were wrong in Citizens United. Well, they're slapping down Montana for trying to keep their own laws alive. You know, they say, you can't do that. We're the law. You know, and and I, I don't see any, any way around all that money. Um, somewhere, it appears, in this society, 
There's a lot of money that never got our way, never got anywhere near. I mean, think of what, you know, just the presidential race. How long could they endow this college that it would need nothing else? Just what's being dumped into it in mind-numbing commercials that no one is watching anymore. But they bought the time, they got the money, and they're going to spend it. Anybody else? Any other, any other thoughts, questions? Julie. Dennis, what would it take to change the party system? What's that? What would it take to change the two-party system? Ooh. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I guess probably what would have to happen first would be the, in, in this case, I'd say it would have to happen to the Republican Party, given that they're the ones that are hunkered down around their own goal line and will not move ideologically. But they would have to suffer a defeat of New Deal magnitude, where they're looking around and when Franklin Roosevelt passed Social Security, the Wagner Act, and so on, there were 26, I think it was, Republican senators. The rest were Democrats. And there were 350, I think it was, Democrats in the House. And so basically what he was able to say to the Republicans, everybody talks about how, you know, big stuff's got to be bipartisan. Bull. What he basically told them was, if you want to come to the sessions, feel free. But your votes aren't going to count. We're going to do what we're going to do because it's the right thing to do. And the 1936 election more or less demonstrated that the people thought, yeah, that's, that's fine. We'll just go along with that. If he hadn't done some pretty stupid things in 37 and 38, who knows what might have happened in 1940. But he, that's when we've had it. And, and Johnson and uh, not the Civil Rights Act, that was before the Goldwater election, but Medicare, Medicaid, the Voting Rights Act, and so on were all with huge Democratic majorities. It's just overwhelming. And that's probably pretty much what you'd have to do, just have one or two elections like that, so that that party would have to do what the Republicans did for at least a while after the New Deal and after the Goldwater election. Come back toward the center and start to negotiate, and start to talk, and start to think about it. But you know, our party system, I, I don't want to overdo this, but, but our party system until maybe the last 30 years, not even quite that long. Our party system had a funky feel to it because it had a regional dimension as well as an ideological dimension. And it was straight out of the Civil War era, you know, the Republicans, the Democrats, but you had all these Southern Democrats, they were relatively conservative, but they liked the idea of being committee chairs, so they voted with the other Democrats. And the Republicans had two different wings and so there was a lot of putting together of coalitions, a bill at a time, and that was possible, and they were across party lines. But they weren't that far across ideological divides. They were pretty far, they were across party divides. Now party and ideological divides are so coterminous that, you know, I, I felt sorry for Elizabeth Warren, and I thought that David